Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst and today I'm speaking with Luca Müller, who is the founding partner of MME, a Swiss law firm with extensive Web3 experience and the co-founder of Signum Bank, a crypto forward bank headquartered in Switzerland and Singapore. Luca, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you, Friederike. I um, looked into our records and Brian and I last spoke with you four years ago. So this was in 2019. And uh, just to give like a little bit of background um, about you. So you co-founded the Swiss law firm MME, which helped set up the Ethereum Foundation and structure the Ethereum token sale, um, along with, with um, several other high profile ICOs like Cosmos and Tezos. Um, you also more recently, um, but not all that recently, founded a crypto native bank uh, called Signum with he headquarters in Switzerland, Singapore. So obviously in this ecosystem, four years are uh, like uh, 24 years in real life um, and lots of things have happened. Um, how has your work at MME and Signum changed over, um, over uh, the last couple of years? I would say in the beginning it was a, it was an understanding of how the eco, how this new ecosystem and uh, is will work and uh, what uh, what legal challenges and regulatory regulatory and also tax challenges um, are triggered by this new way of issuing uh, decentralization uh, and uh, all these elements of of these new ecosystems. So that was, let's say, in the beginning, it was a lot of learning, uh, testing as well, uh, and and understanding. Uh, and what I must say is, I have never been disappointed by the technology. It worked, and uh, even if you have read the, the the original white paper, the promises were kept. So uh, that was the good thing. What we learned is that in the course of the development, you have seen a lot of intermediaries entering into this space, and uh, um, which was actually against the original thinking of decentralization. But already in the early days, we saw that there is a need of a trusted digital gateway or digital or a trusted gateway, access gateway to the DLT. I know that some of the hardcore um, decentralization believers, uh, they would object. Um, yes, of course, it, this does not mean that uh, we want to centralize the technology. It means that some centralization in the gateway functionality to the technology is needed. And Coming back to your question, first we were uh, involved a lot into the, let's say, layer one and some of the layer two basic infrastructure questions and the work has now shifted a bit more to the legal and regulatory questions regarding the gateway functionalities, intermediation functionalities, platform functionalities, interface functionalities to this technology. I think this is a really nice segue to Signum. Um, so maybe let's talk about, because m most listeners won't be customers of yours, right? So basically, can you walk us through what services Signum currently offers and who its users typically are? In the early days of uh, the, uh, the crypto DLT adoption, we saw that the banks were quite reluctant to get to grant access to a fiat gateway. And uh, then we thought, you know, we should change that. And that was the reason. That was the originally the original genesis thought which we had when we uh, decided to set up Signum as a digital asset bank. And what uh, we saw is what I just referred before. You know, we saw we need to grant a, let's say, for an adoption of this technology and the features of these, this technology, you need to, we need to create, construct, program a trusted um, access, a digital access to the technology. That means, you know, trusted custody, trusted transactions, trusted um, exchanges, price settings, and that was needed. And we made a bet, you know, we uh, originally we made a bet and we saw, okay, two bets, actually three bets. One is that um, uh, it needs to have a license. You know, this is an activity which is a, a typical a typical licensed activity and that actually that was the reason why we went for a bank, the highest standard 
you can actually have as a license. Secondly, we saw in the adoption and development two jurisdictions which were spearheading the whole development. This is and was um, at that time uh, Switzerland and Singapore. We saw that the US is not regulating. So without the regulation, it's not you, you don't have the necessary legal certainty. So we concentrated on these two jurisdictions. And uh, so we had a license, the two jurisdictions focus, and then you need to have an excellent team. And we have an excellent team at Signum um, setting, up, um, setting up all the necessary infrastructure to provide this trusted access to the digital asset world. So coming to the services which we provide, we provide um, a fiat gateway, we provide custody solutions, we provide tokenization solutions, um, exchanges, brokerage, so the typical um, functions you need that you can have a secure, a, a very secure access to the digital, to the uh, DLT world. Okay, so I can um, have a regular account with you guys that I load with uh, Swiss francs or euros or USD probably. Yes. Um, and I can natively buy buy things do you have have your own exchange or how how so basically you say I I say look I'm here now I want to buy I don't know Binance tokens um, can I buy them on on your exchange or what do I do? First of all, I mean you need to be a qualified investor, a qualified <laughs> because we we are not actually off serving for retail. This has a specific purpose. That's the first hurdle you have to climb. Secondly. Um, we have a we have a, some we have quite clear criteria on the tokens which we list on uh, our uh, offering, uh, and it's not actually some of the tokens we we list because we actually um, I, I, I must say the, the limitation is not always the quality. The limitation is also the technology. We cannot actually um, provide a secure storage for all the tokens which which we would like to do. So there is a bit a limit. Uh, we started with the major ones. So um, yes, you can transfer um, fiat to your account once it's open, and you can actually buy uh, via our gateway whatever token we have listed and keep it in keep it uh, in custody in our bank. We are not running an exchange. We work with brokers, so we we actually get the best price for you when we buy the tokens for you transparently open as and really on a professional basis okay but this is all this is all manual brokerage i mean manual <laughs> yes to a certain extent it is manual it's not a defi exchange which is running fully automatically no it's not but it is quite 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 uh, optimized why, why did you make the decision to not offer to retail but only to businesses Two reasons. One is it's a regulatory reason. Our banking license, at the, which for which we applied, is limited. Um, uh, that not the license actually. Our organization internal under the license is limited for for um, qualified investors. Because if we actually would have applied also for uh, or uh, enlarged our uh, organization also for the retail, this would have been a complete other organizational setup because you would need to actually cover much more demand, much more transactions. And for us, um, we decided to to limit our offering for the um, qualified, which made it a little bit easier in the uh, license process. And on the other hand, it is also easier in the, uh, the technology which we had to set up. Um, at the beginning, I would say we improved our technology, our platform dramatically uh, in the past. Uh, and there were discussions uh, uh, whether or not we would open our, our services also for the retail. But at the moment, it's out of discussion. If in the future we decide otherwise, we don't know. At the moment, we keep, our, we keep it as it is. Uh, we have a, <laughs> a lot of clients to serve at the moment so it's 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 it was a good decision that we kept it like this at the big for us from the beginning okay um you very diplomatically kind of uh, it didn't go into whether i can actually buy binance tokens as um as a customer of your your 
uh, bank. But um, let's say I want to buy Ethereum, which I'm sure I can actually buy. Um, will you actually do stuff with it for me? So can can I ask you to also stake it for oh, me? Of course. Okay. And do you do this in-house or do you outsource it? Half, half. We have uh, some of the infrastructure we have in-house, some of the uh, infrastructure we have um, outsourced. Okay. And do you only do vanilla staking or do you also um, kind of go degen bank and try to generate interest? Say, if I ha hold stables in my account, can I ask you to put it on curve for me or something? No, we don't do that. Okay. So it's just staking. It's just staking. We are working on services, let's say on... on uh, adding also DeFi services to our um, uh, for our clients but at the moment it's not possible and we are in a constant um, in a constant communication with our regulators to find ways how we can connect to DeFi services to DeFi functionalities in a banking environment so and you see here this is a productive interaction with the regulators. You know, we we, we it's, it's step by step. You know, the, also the DeFi's are getting better and better. Uh, we are in, uh, improving our services, and I hope once uh, in the future it will be possible that we as a bank can connect directly with DeFi's. At the moment, it's not possible. Okay, um, you said a moment ago that you have a, a lot of customers at the moment, which I assume is also partially um, caused by the FDX demise that we saw last year and the entailing demise of a number of CFI venues that kind of culminated in Silvergate's bankruptcy, right? So basically, um, a lot of Web3 native uh, companies all of a sudden were out of um, a banking partner. So I assume that kind of brought you a lot of business, right? Yes, actually, we have a decent number of clients. We have a quite a big pipeline of client of, of, of <laughs> let's say, prospects, to be correct. Yes, the the FTX and um, other um, inter platforms uh, they brought us a lot of interest. That's correct. Please keep in mind we cannot um, onboard U.S. clients. So some of these clients they don't have a base yet because we simply can't do it. We excluded the U.S. base uh, for the moment uh, as a client uh, base. So. Yes, uh, many of the many we, we got a lot of inflow because of uh, these events which happened in 2022 and also 2023. Can you share your thoughts on kind of what happened and what went wrong with FTX and kind of uh, the the dominoes that kind of uh, kept falling afterwards? Yeah, you see, that's the reason why we went for the license. You know, you see, if you go the intermediary way. You keep, you hold clients' assets and you have to protect these assets the best way you can. You cannot mingle these assets with your own assets. You, you have to separate them from your balance sheet risks. And this is what we did, you know, and from the beginning, as from the inception, and we had to because it, was, it would have costed us too much as capital costs if we had it in our balance sheet. So, so we had a segregated, secure, protected way under our banking license. And that was exactly the right thing to do. And it is also in in the DNA of decentralization. So it's it's not um, if if you if you ha if you run a gateway for for um, the, the users, the clients, they want to be sure that their assets are kept in secure, segregated in accounts, in addresses, uh, that which uh, on which there there is a clear control and not mingled up with the balance sheet risks. And I think. This is what triggered also the activities at the moment in the US. You know, they have seen you know, in, at the front door, you know, there are exchanges, very successfully operating ex exchanges, you know. And I wouldn't say, say that they were criminals or stealing, but they just did not have a proper setup. I know it's bad form to kind of call competitors or former competitors out on their behavior, but you would actually stand by um, the fact that the FTX crew were not criminals? I mean, you're talking to a lawyer, you know. For me, a criminal is a criminal once he or she is convicted to be a okay. criminal. You know, actually that's, and this is a really basic principle. People tend to forget that, you know. it's And it's I have seen so many, and I was a former public prosecutor, so I know ex so many discussions about, you know, this guy or she is a criminal. And, you know, this is just, 
not knowing all the details of the fact, because if you're a criminal, you need to have it proven, and it, the facts must be absolutely okay, that's solid. Fair. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm. That's uh, why I said, you know, I'm very reluctant to actually qualify somebody a criminal. Yeah, but absolutely. What I can say from, let's say, from the outside is that their organization, their risk management, their technical setup, was not the proper way to do it. Oh yeah, that's, absolutely. That, this is what I could say from the outside. But from the outside, what we can also say is that the FTX crew, um, SBF, most of all, um actually permanently called for more regulation um, and regulation at all. Um, how do you kind of make these puzzle pieces fit together in your mind? I don't know. I mean, I've, I, 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 I don't know if he, if he really called for regulation, but I, I think if he had, he was right. Uh, at the moment, what we have is regulation by enforcement and um, I would wish that uh, the US uh, would take the lead uh, in regulation and not in enforcement, you know, and that would be tremendously helpful for the whole ecosystem. I think it's fair to say that kind of in the broader public, um, the perception of crypto kind of took, took a beating in the FTX wake. Um, if you go to crypto Twitter, um, this perception is much more nuanced, right? So basically, um, they're basically CFI gets most of the flack and um, uh, people are quick to point out that actually none of the major DeFi protocols went down because you don't have to trust, right? So basically, if you have intermediaries who kind of who are custodying your funds or in charge of your funds, you, you have to trust them, right? While kind of being active in DeFi, you kind of you primarily have to trust yourself and your own proce processes as well as kind of um, the fact that the DeFi protocols are pr properly audited. Have these narratives in any way kind of um, affected Signum as well? So I know, I, I understand that you are a major beneficiary from kind of, uh, I mean, kind of being one of the last trusted, uh, one, of, uh, one of the last trusted intermediaries standing. Obviously, this is kind of like a major um, bonus. But um, have, have you also gotten flack from the other side? Exactly. Uh, yes, of course, of course. And I think the technology decentralization community is absolutely right. And, and that's what I always, when I've been asked, you know, say, you know, it's the amazing thing is that the technology so far has not disappointed me at all. I mean, the technology is working properly. You trust the art. You can trust in certain codes. You can. And also the DeFi's are working properly. So what you've seen in the past is a failure of the human interface, you know, whether they are programming or whether these interfaces involved in, in custody and brokerage or whatsoever, intermediation. And what our goal is and what we, our vision is at Signum is that we want to replicate this technology with our interface, that we want to be as trustful as the protocols running, you know, and this is this is our goal which we want to achieve because um uh, and and also in the broader public if the broader public is talking about crypto very often they don't refer to the technology very often they, they refer to the people trading and dealing and custody and stealing crypto you know so yes this this again wave of negative perception. I have actually suffered under many waves of negative perception in <laughs> since I'm working in the crypto space and it always makes me quite angry because it is so often that, the, that let's say these the advantages and the, the the radical futures of these this technology gets forgotten. The very first domino that kind of got the entire dominoes kind of tumbling um was of course, uh, Terra Luna, right? So, I mean, that was perfectly DeFi in the sense that basically everything was out in the open and basically it was basically everything worked exactly as specified by the protocol. Um, but this still came tumbling down, right? So basically, even if kind of, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that the protocol was underspecified or, or whatever, basically other smart contracts worked as anticipated. Um, it was kind of just um, the economic behavior that was differing from kind of what the founders had envisaged. 
do you think kind of customers need to need protection from these kinds of risks as well? Every program has its limits, you know, and DeFi have so many features. There are so many kinds of different DeFi's and they were, they were very ambitious to actually program a, a algorithmic stable coin. They actually, and I don't know if it works or not, but it was really difficult to do that. And, and, um, we will see in the future failures of programs inevitable this happens you know the challenge is with these um pro uh, programs being deployed running you know self uh, in, on a self execution basis unstoppable you know is that once out out so it's very difficult so even if you would say we need to protect the investors it's quite difficult because you know an investor if if he she wants she can access even without an interface and so yes that's one of these are the challenges and i think the community needs to actually in a way self regulate that they can actually increase the uh, the standards of programs the standard of functionalities and also expectations how they function uh, in on a, on a very under a very high load and i think the protection must come from the intermediaries so if they list such a token they need to be absolutely clear in the uh, in, in the risk assessment and in the risk declaration for their users and clients so i think and the, this is what has to be done you know so if if if, if a, a platform is listing uh, this uh, let's say a, a very revolutionary algorithmic defi they need to be absolutely aware of the risks. And I think at the beginning, you know, in the, the early stage of crypto, everybody knew about all these risks. And nevertheless, they invested because it was, it, they took the risk. And I think, you know, it's, it's also something which is very easy to say, you know, after a collapse, a lot of people say, oh, I, I knew it, you know. <laughs> but before, you know, it, 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 they, people hype all these projects and and uh, we we had them on the show like um two or three weeks after they launched and i very clearly called them out and said look if 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 there's no way basically if the bottom falls out there's nothing to break the fall and they they said oh we respectfully disagree so there were lots of people who did actually call them out on because the economics were blatantly unsound but basically people were still happy to kind of roll with it because you know number go up so uh yeah, you see, that's but that's and 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 tell them they knew the risk, you know, and that some of the risks and yeah. But this is one thing that's why I said, you know, it's not only um, a standard on the on the gateway; it's also a standard and also a, a quality discussions on the level two, level one. That's of course, um, this has to be happen as well. Maybe let's um, kind of shift gear a little bit and look into the future, right? So basically. There's another major Swiss crypto bank called Sever, and they recently expanded to Hong Kong. Um, how do you see the APEC tra trajectory in the crypto business? Because, I mean, you also, you're based in uh, Switzerland and Singapore. So um, I assume that was a very deliberate decision. Um, how do you see that region's importance? I would say this APEC region has a very pragmatic access to new technology. That was one of the reasons, you know, they're very pragmatic. And I think this is the Asian style, not too complicated, not, not to make it too complicated to see the, the economic advantage behind it and then try to find uh, sound solutions. And I think uh, that was one of the reasons why we have chosen to go to uh, or focus on this uh, jurisdictional region. It came to me a bit as a surprise that I saw Hong Kong is back <laughs> in the game. They were very active, you know, many years ago. Then we had the Chinese ban. Uh, now it seems to be a more an ambiguous way what they are dealing. Uh, this uh, the Chinese, I, I I can't read them actually what they what they have in mind, but it seems to me uh, on a first um, interpretation that they are opening again you know and they are i mean they are clever i, I mean they are really clever and it's I've, maybe this is another this is another advantage of this region people there they are really clever i mean they have bright brains uh as i said pragmatic uh and uh, they have this 
also investment gene, which is more open than, for example, we Swiss, we are still very conservative, traditional, and, and I wouldn't say not too dynamic, but this region is very <laughs> dynamic. <laughs> yeah. Switzerland still gets um, a lot of uh, game in the crypto sphere, right? So basically in terms of, you know, legal popular des destinations for, um, you know, you know, choosing your jurisdiction for your project. Um, why would you say that is? I think the Swiss are very good. We are very good in execution. We are very good execution. And that means, you know, once we have, an, I mean, we, we did not invent uh, DLT. It came from other areas. But we have seen the advantages. And what we, as I said, because we are very good at execution, we studied profoundly and we see what we can do, where are the risks, and we deal with it in a very, and we and also we dealt with it in a, at the very early stage of the development. And I think this was the advantage. We, did, we just did not ignore it or push it away or let it let's grow in a, in a jungle. We addressed the topics very, very early. We addressed the risks very, very early. And this actually created a very fruitful basis or working relationship between the projects, their advisors, the regulators, the authorities, uh, and, and created trust as well. And I think this ground, this fruitful ground, with the history which we have already now, because with every year and every day, you know, you increase um, your experience in this field, the experience and the know-how, uh, not only from the advisor or let's say um, project side, but also from the to, uh, from the the, the, the know-how and experience of the uh, regulators and and administration you have to deal with. Give you an example. I mean, 2014 when we had to deal with the um, with the tax authorities, you know, it was absolutely brand new for them. Now, if you talk with the tax authorities, for example, in Zook, you know, they know how it works. They know the, what, what the mechanics behind it. And it's easy to talk with them because you actually uh, talk with them on the same level. So I would say pragmatic, very good in execution, which means we dig into the details, look at it and execute it with the longstanding and, and increasing um, education experience, which we had in Switzerland, made us a really good uh, jurisdiction for um, this new technology. Yeah, I mean, as a founder, I can tell you that this is not the case everywhere, right? So basically, it's actually the case almost nowhere um, that you can openly discuss things with regulators and um, tax authorities and so on. And they will actually sit down at a table with you and kind of try to come up with an answer. So I'm quite, uh, I mean, you can hear that I'm from, from the neighbor in the north, <laughs> right? So basically, <laughs> here, they tell you nothing, like literally nothing. It's crazy. Maybe Maybe I jump in here, you know? This is a fundamental difference of the of uh, society and political culture, and it starts with our tax declaration. There is the base of trust. So the government trusts every citizen that the citizen is declaring her his tax correctly. So this is this baseline of trust that the authorities don't think that you want to cheat them. And I think this is the same approach if you address or if you interact with the authorities. When we interact with the authorities, we don't want to cheat them. And the authorities don't see us as somebody who wants to cheat them. So I think this baseline of trust is one of the recipes why we can openly discuss because it is this base layer of trust which actually which helps both sides. Do you think there's a um, different understanding of kind of who the state is and whom it serves in Switzerland than compared to Germany? What is the reason behind why we trust our authorities and why the authorities trust us? Because I think we have a common goal. We think the government is ours. We, we think the state is ours. We have to protect. So it's not actually that we want to go for a short-term advantage it is we feel responsible and i think um every swiss thinks i own a part of switzerland and i'm responsible also for my soil and and for my country and 
I think this is an at- a bit more a different attitude. It's also the way how we can vote and how we can um, interact. You know, we have these direct democratical systems, which is very unique. Maybe this is also a part of our government citizen relationship DNA, which we have, which is different in Germany. Yeah, here yeah, it's very much, m- much more top down. So, um, yeah, I agree. Um, so, um, Switzerland used to be a famed um, privacy preserving jurisdiction, and this has kind of changed um, over the last couple of years. So, where do you think Switzerland stands um, in the AML, KYC uh, spectrum in terms of, uh, you know, right, right of privacy? Yeah, I mean, there are two really conflicting interests you have you're mentioning here you know on one hand you know you have this comp- and it's very difficult to handle these different um, let's say interests on one hand you have the interest to protect your infrastructure from criminals from criminal money and that you have the highest standard in AML KYC anti-terrorism financing and all these uh, regulations which are correct and we have to have there no compromise and the highest standard we had to open, um, um, we had to be much more transparent be- due to this um, enforcement of all it or, or in- enactment of all these uh, tax treaties uh, and tax information treaties, which we had since many years already, which I think is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's good. It actually it's, it creates the same um, uh, play field for everybody. And uh, that's a good development. I think hiding untaxed money is not a sustainable business uh, concept and that's correct and that's good and I think it was a huge advantage for Switzerland. On the other hand, you know, privacy is getting more and more an issue. It's too dangerous if, you know, if it's everything is too transparent and I, even for myself, you know, I, I, I think, you know, what if I must say since three weeks, you know, I'm, I'm using Instagram because we are launching a new campaign and they said, now, Luca, you have to actually use Instagram as well. And if I search something, you know, I'm, I'm amazed what I get as as ads, you know. So somebody's reading me, you know, of course, uh, I know I knew that. But if you see it so visibly, you know, uh, you get a little bit afraid of, 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 of your privacy. And I think protection of privacy also in the context of DLT, actually, because we have transaction tra- transparency, you know, it's, it, this will be a major, major, major um, a challenge in the future. And I think... We have there is it is a human a basic human need, and 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 wish for privacy, and we should protect that. Uh, I agree one hundred percent. I think um, it may be more of a cultural war than a technological war, right? Because in in terms of technology, we can build a lot of privacy preserving technology, but kind of in the last say ten twenty years, in the public perception, this idea that you inherently have a human right to privacy, it's kind of been eroded away, right? So basically, people don't really view it the same way anymore as they did, say, um, in the 80s or so. And I mean, even even things that are done in the realm of AML, KYC and so on, it's somewhat new, right? So basically, having bank accounts that are pretty transparent and kind of queryable electronically and so on, this didn't used to be the case, right? So basically kind of things were kind of like in paper forms and siloed away in different banks and so on. And um, do, do you think this is something that kind of we need to rise up against politically? Um, because I think it's not a technological pr- problem. I think, in, I mean, I understand why people, why why, why both um, companies kind of um, mine this data and I understand why um, the state once the state of mind, especially uh, relating to financials and uh, money laundering and uh, terrorism financing and so on. But do you think we kind of need to reset this expectation that this is fair game? There are many initiatives, you know, data protection laws have been increasingly tougher in the past. Uh, and I think that's a good development, a very good development. I think we cannot delegate our need for privacy to the government. We can't do that. The government has its own interests, you know, and 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 has other interests to pursue, like AML KYC, uh, and uh, has to balance it as well. But I think we, as human being beings, it, it's up to us to say, okay, now stop. This is now too much. 
and we are lacking a little bit behind now i think it's we are in a period of we let it go we let it we let it happen and and it's 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 we tolerate we tolerate it at the moment we tolerate a lot of uh, let's say of non privacy treatment with us and if it gets too much or something happened maybe then then there is a need created to to actually object to this erosion as you said which i fully agree it is an erosion of our privacy of our privacy you know and and at, then then we have to stand up again and say hey guys i mean this is now too much we we want to have our privacy reinstalled again because we regard privacy as a human right do you think by kind of going along with it for too long, we will kind of forfeit um, that? That's what I meant. You know, maybe there's a period of tolerance. You know, if we had other, we had other things. We were we, we, we discussing about climate changes. We discussed about, you know, what, what whatever, like the war now. It went a little bit out of focus. And, you know, it's it's also our it's our fault as well. Because if, if we decide, very often if you decide, okay, do I want to protect my privacy or do I want to use now this new application, you decide for the application, forget about the privacy. And you're on, you're on Instagram now. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but not active, I'm a passive. <laughs> so I, I, I can't even download things, but it's actually, I, I could, but I, it's, it's, it, I, I've just tried it out uh, because we, we run a campaign on, on Instagram and, and I, I want to see how it works. Maybe let's kind of go from like a uh, depressing topic to depressing topic. So um, <laughs> the U.S. So you you kind of referred earlier to the U.S. as kind of a culture of um, regulation by enforcement. Um, and it does actually seem like the U.S. is on an anti-crypto crusade. What, what do you make of this? I don't know if it's the culture of the U.S., uh, to actually uh, rather enforce and regulate. I don't know. In crypto, it is the case that now they, the way is that the US authorities are enforcing rather than regulating. I There are many speculations why it is like this. There is a, a, a fight between the institutions, which of the institutions shall be responsible for what. Uh, the, the SEC has to enforce a very old concept. I mean, it's not their fault. That, and again, you know, this is, you see how regulation kicks in. You know, they have to apply what is available. And if you have an old concept, you have an old concept. And, and, and if it had been clear that the old concept would cover the, the, some of the tokens they had probably started with enforcement much earlier, but it shows clearly that it is a dilemma. You know, they, they, it's not clear, the situation. Again, another reason why it should be clarified by either a policy paper or a regulation. I think the authorities in the U.S. started with these enforcement act activities so late because it takes also time to prepare and, 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 and resources uh, to go uh, to, to do all these enforcement activities, to proceed with all these act enforcement activities. And I think they had been triggered to really start with, I wouldn't say crusade, but with all these activities because they had a f really a failure like FTX at their front door. But I hope this will go, this will pass, you know, it, and I'm very confident that it will pass. It's just, f for me, it is a little bit frustrating to see that the questions are the same questions which, they, which we deal now, which already were on the table 10 years ago. So it's, that's, that's a little bit frustrating, you know, this, why waiting so long and creating this uncertainty? But why do you think they're going after companies that kind of, in my view, are really goody two-shoes and kind of ask about regulation, how to behave like multiple times, like for instance, Coinbase, right? So in my view, Coinbase is not a bad actor. No, um, not at all. Yeah. No. I don't know. Simply, I don't know. I mean, there must be some policy decision. A regulator would not do that without the clear let's say, internal policy, what they want to achieve with it. I don't, I, I, I can't read them, definitely. I can tell you what kind of the crypto Twitter take on this is. Um, the crypto Twitter take is that kind of the US are a nation kind of in uh, decline. Um, and basically the parties themselves are failing and kind of the Democratic Party kind of um, needed a, a topic that um, a 
decent number of people could rally behind, um, kind of to make them look strong. Um, and uh, they settled on crypto because uh, all politicians are like 75 plus and uh, they have never actually don't see, really see the benefit in Web3 and tokenization and, and so on, you know, because they are without wanting to be ageist because they're old and it's just a different... <laughs> it's just different generation and this kind of seemed like a topic that they could bash because it's you know only a minority of people who are who actually feel strongly about this and and they can do this to make themselves look strong and active in yeah i mean obviously this is very simplistic but do you think there's something to it my first reaction when i saw all these um claims being filed in court I, my first reaction was what amount of money being wasted at the moment? I mean, just c can you imagine what these claims costs? I would say they add to billions, you know. For what exactly? The potential that one part is losing, are the other one not, so that we get some clarity? I would say, and that's that was actually is 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 painful, you know. This really lost and 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 waste of resources. If these resources, all these brilliant lawyers working on both sides, you know, on the uh, on the and uh, the claimant and the defendant side, would actually put their heads together, work for a very um, very concise, good regulation. That would be a right investment of funds, you know, and that would be actually putting the U.S. back to the leader of regulation rather than the leader of enforcement. And yes, to a certain extent, if uh, you start, actually you have already lost if you go the enforcement path. So I feel I feel a bit sorry for the situation as it is in the US. I really feel sorry for the whole industry the, and the global industry. Let's kind of switch unpleasant to topics again. Yes. So obviously, <laughs> I mean, this kind of brings us to the EU, right? So basically the EU kind of came up with this uh, Mika regulation, so markets in crypto assets. How, how how do you see that? Much better. Much better. I think I think this is um I mean, you can always discuss about, you know, the content of a regulation, whether or not it's too actually it's, it's too it's too um, restrictive or, or not clear enough. But at least we have a bone to to bone a, a, a piece of meat we can work on, you know, at least, you know. And I embrace it. I I think it's good what they did. It's good. I mean, I'm not happy with everything which is in there. Definitely not. But uh, and I'm, I was also not happy with all with the let's say the interpretation of our FINMA in 2018 uh, when they made the token classification. I was not entirely happy with all the classification, but at least you had a, an orientation. And in this new area, in this new area which we are, you know, orientation is is, is really important. Is really important. I agree that you set some stones which are very difficult to carry away later on once we see they, they were they were placed at the wrong place. I, I, I agree with you, but at least they are there and as they serve and as an orientation. So overall, I embrace and I think it's a positive development which had in, in, in the European Union. Okay, that's that's good to hear. Luca, maybe let's look, uh, let, let's kind of move away from regulation for a second. So um, you've been in... Uh, Web3 for a long time. Do you use any crypto products, you know, personally? Of course, I'm a, a big fan of the Ethereum. I'm a big Ethereum staker. Oh, super nice. So you run your own nodes or you delegate? I'm I'm delegating, actually. Um, I, I don't have the time to run my own nodes. <laughs> super nice. And do you, um, do you also partake in DeFi? Not actively. And uh, here I must confess, you know, I'm not a trader investor in in a way that I'm not this trading guy. I I, I I'm in the DeFi space, and I'm in the advising big DeFi DeFi projects because I'm genuinely interested in 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 how it works, what are the impacts. But I personally, uh, I'm not invested in DeFi. Okay, and um. I think you kind of you bring us to like the crux of the matter, right? So basically, currently, um, 
you say you're not a trader. So basically, a lot of it is still very speculative. So there's very little actual usage of the underlying projects, right? So how do you see the broader adoption? I mean, you've been in crypto for, what, 10 years, right? So what's what's missing to kind of make people not just see this as a speculative asset, but to actually use the products that crypto can, in principle, supply them with? I always was, although I profit, I actually profited from this hype, I was always very suspicious with this uh, all this hype and trading and, and, and activity around crypto because I saw it come that this would actually be uh, could have the potential of a backfire i would say the layer ones they they need to be still uh, more efficient you know and secure we see already with ethereum yes there is a community using it and and it will be a protocol layer which will be used uh, definitely and and here it is a new way to invest and to participate in an infrastructure um, uh, and this is what Ethereum is, is, is actually, uh, yes, creating a new world of interacting with your infrastructure you use, you know, you can, uh, and I think that's an interesting uh, staking and, 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 and using these uh, Ethereum tokens. And on, on the application level, you know, what I thought that, I think this was my, my uh, one of my um, bets, which... I was completely wrong. I thought that the DLT technology could be very radical in the traditional finance uh, um, sector. And I, I was first, you know, I was involved in a shared, in, in a token project, uh, tokenizing shares, because it was for me obvious that if you have shares, you know, and you have a smart contract running your um, your shareholder register, you could pay out dividends directly, you can exercise your voting rights via your um, share token, that would be a radical, it would be really radical, and, and it would be very, very um, efficient to, to interact now, you as a shareholder with your own camp company. And we invested very early in, 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 in tokenizing of shares. But, you know, is as long as the whole ecosystem is not ad adopting to this new technology, and if you're alone there, you know, it's very difficult. So I think um, in, the traditional, in, in, in the traditional finance, using the new t this new technology stack, it's, uh, it is, it's still we have to wait for these kind of solutions. They're coming, they're coming, they're slowly getting into it, uh, I, I think, but it needs more time for the adoption than we think, uh, than we thought that originally. Um, but it will come, I'm sure it will come. Now for some kind of easy applications, the, um, the, the NFTs showed us a way how it could do on the collectical art side, you know, that this functionality that you can own something, your own IP and you transfer it, that actually is interesting. I have not seen many projects using it now in the traditional space. What you see now, it's in the, some of the big brands are using it uh, as, as, as first use cases. This will come as well. This has also an own, let's say, an own functionality and an own sector which will come and is about to come. And the rest is, is, is still very early, you know. And, and as you know, Frederica, it's very difficult sometimes to interact with some of these DeFi's because, you know, the interface is really for height, is for techies, not for the, for the broader public. So I think the, the, the adoption is also about, you know, how the usability and the interaction with it. Yeah, I think that's that's a fair assessment, kind of using a lot of the things. And I think maybe that is also the way that it should be for now, because a lot of them are um, very experimental. And I I wouldn't want to sucker anyone kind of into using them without kind of knowing what exactly. they're doing. Let's kind of look at um, the, uh, the other innovators in this space, uh, the states. What are your thoughts on CBDC? Yeah, CBDC is a tech from a technical point of view, it's not a challenge. I mean, you could do that. Oh no, it's not, not. definitely yeah. not. I mean, you could do that. It's it's political. I mean, it's 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 radical. It's it's actually thinking through. It's it's reinventing our traditional banking system. You know, if you as a user could sit directly uh, on the balance sheet of the national bank, that's a game changer. 
So I think, uh, I think, uh, uh, and also um, privacy as well. I mean, it's it's as if 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 you um, have the ambition to replace cash with CBDC, you have to solve the privacy issue. You know, and, and that's I mean, cash is cash. And do, I'm, I'm you know I'm sitting also on the board of Orel Fiesli, which is the money printer in Switzerland, um, partly owned by the Swiss National Bank. You know, and we were discussing uh, very often. We are discussing about you know the challenges of the banknotes being out of the market because everybody's using technology. But if you see worldwide, more banknotes are being printed. You know, it's just that there is again what we refer to what we discussed later on. You know, there is a need or a, a let's say a, a basic human need for privacy, and that's why cash. And I mean, apart also some of the areas in the world they don't have a banking system, so they anyhow would need to have um, um, cash. But there is a need and there is also a wish for cash, you know. And so if you actually enter into the CPTC retail space, you, you need to solve this. You know, if you want to have something functionally similar to a, to cash, you need to solve the privacy issue. But any, what I said before, it's a political question. You know, it's, it's, it's how you set the new games with the banks and the, and the national banks. It has not been solved yet. Yeah, absolutely not. I was recently at a meeting where um, the delegate from the European Central Bank, um, German guy, uh, the guy who's in, in charge of the technology side. Um, he said um, that if they actually um, do a retail CBTC, they will kind of institute a limit um, for uh, users or you know citizens who kind of hold money with the central bank because they are afraid of destabilizing the, uh, the regular banking sector because people would say, look, there's, I'm not getting interest anyways. I might as well just hold my savings with the national bank. At least there I don't actually have any risks. Do you see that as a, I mean, w with Switzerland, you know, being a pretty banking heavy country, do you think there's a battle coming uh, between kind of like the commercial banking sector and uh, the citizens or the state? Uh, I mean, you referred exactly to the topic which I meant, this political part, you know. And I think in the Switzerland, we would have we would need to change the law, you know, in order to be able to to um, issue a CBDC, because this would need probably a new legal foundation. To what extent the national bank can now offer in banking services as well? This is my uh, my guess. So at the moment, I think. There is, it is not on the political agenda uh, in Switzerland to issue a retail CPTC. What are the current trends that kind of excite you, that make, that, that make you kind of like happy to be in this space, that kind of get you up in the morning and say, I'm super happy I'm working in this space because we can make that and that happen? First of all, I mean, what they did in Ethereum with all these new releases, this makes me really confident that we have a very good layer ones, you know, uh, serving the community. And I see a lot of very good layer two projects as well. You know, very innovative, good initiatives, uh, very active, a very, very, it's, the community is still very active, you know, it's, it, and a lot of positive energy is flowing into it. Although you have this constant hammer of negative news and, and, and perception, you know, and it also happens to me, you know, I have so many good projects, but if I open LinkedIn, if I open every day, I get a negative uh, news, you know. I even think, you know, we should stop with all this negative news because we get frustrated over time, you know, if we read it every day. But nevertheless, you know, I see, I see a lot of positive energy. Yes, it may be the younger generation has not the same patience as, as the older ones. Maybe we have to. But my message is, you know, my message is don't give up. You know, don't give up, really. It's, it's, it's all, with all these negative news, Believe it, and it's a good thing. You know, the technology, this technology has a lot of very, very good efficient free, uh, features, which helps us, have, helps every citizen. So we should actually work for this. And that this is which uh, makes me, which motivates me every morning to get up and getting involved in all these topics. But as I said, you know, I must say, I was very often, sometimes I get, if I see another wave of negative news rolling over us, you know, it's getting, it gets on, it can get on your nerves. Definitely. If you could wish for one thing for, you know, the rest of the year, 
what would you like to happen this year for crypto? If there would be a note from the US government and say, guys, now, next year, we actually issue a regulation, a crypto regulation. That would be really helpful and that it would be enlightening my day. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's not often we kind of wish for regulation, but obviously kind of having regulatory clarity Regular is clarity, um, yes. so, so important. important. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So your word in Gary's ear. <laughs> Let's see whether we can make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on again. Thank Luca. you, Frederike. It was very nice. Pleasant to talk to you.